Hey guys, how's it going? So this is our Monday weekly recap video and I think the last video we're gonna upload before Christmas. So I wanted to start this video by wishing you all a very Merry Christmas. I hope you're having an amazing season. It's been a great one for us and I've really enjoyed doing all of our holiday themed projects, but I'm very much looking forward to spring already. Um, there are three orders of business I wanna talk about before we get into the actual videos and answering questions from those. The first was the Analon giveaway. So we did a video cooking chicken tortilla soup and we partnered with Analon who was giving away two 11 piece advanced home cookware sets and five salt cellars. So we have the winners here for you. The winners of the two 11 piece sets are Stephanie Norzasan and Barbara Jennings. And the winners of the five salt cellars are Connor Campbell, Brooke S, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, Jolene Grant, Alex Jeffrey and Cindy S. Congratulations to all of you guys, and thank you to everybody who commented on that video. It was really fun to see, especially those of you who tried the recipe. And those of you who haven't, you really should. It's amazing. And the second thing is an update on our Garden Answer Gathering event that's gonna happen this June. It's the first weekend. I think it's Friday the 6th and 7th, but we are actually gonna offer a second event on the 8th, so I wanted to make sure you guys knew. Now, last year we did this event. It was called the Garden Answer Groupie Field Trip. We've changed the name because it's not, like last year it was organized and promoted on the the groupies Facebook page and I'm sure it'll be talked about and promoted there as well um, but we're gonna do our best to like let you guys know like let all of you know all the details as we know them um, so you can find all of that information on our website gardenanswer.com slash events we're in preliminary planning stage so we don't have a ton of info right now but I'll try to let you know too in these Monday videos as I know more details I'll just be letting you guys know but I wanted to give you kind of a quick snapshot of the event so the first one you can buy a ticket for is on that Friday and Saturday, so two days. Uh, first day will be spent here in my hometown. We're gonna be doing a service project at Project Dove where we're gonna be just blessing those um, people. It's a um, shelter for victims of domestic abuse. And so it's an amazing, it's an amazing time. That was the highlight of the event for this from this last year for me, and I know it was for a lot of people. We're gonna be standing their fence, planting flowers and vegetables, and it'll probably snowball. I'm sure we're gonna be doing quite a number of things there. There's gonna be several classes, like a, an optional succulent arranging class, a flower arranging class that my mom and I are gonna teach, and then a pressed flower craft and pressed flower kind of um, informational class. There's gonna be a rep from Proven Winners here talking about plants. Then that evening, we're gonna be in our garden. Aaron and I are or, um, opening up our garden for you guys to tour. There's gonna be dessert and music. It's gonna be a really beautiful time. And then the next day, we're spending that in Boise, Idaho, because there's a ton to see there. We're gonna be um, touring a rose garden, the Idaho Botanical Garden. There's a catered lunch at a beautiful location. Um, so it's just a really lovely weekend. And it was such an amazing time last year. I'm really looking forward to it. The tickets for that event, we're trying to hone in on the details, but it's gonna be somewhere around $400. It might be a little bit less or a little bit more. We are not making any money from this. Like all of that money goes into the planning of the event and for the stuff that we need to buy for the event. The second option that we're offering is on Sunday the 8th. Um, Aaron and I would like to open up our garden for two different time slots that day uh, for like a less expensive ticket. <laughs> and we're not sure yet exactly what that cost will be. It'll be probably be right around $100. And what we've decided to do is do um, a few hours in our garden and then my parents are gonna be opening up their garden center on a Sunday, which they don't do ever. Um, but they're gonna do that so that you know, there'll be two groups of people that can kind of switch. So one group will be in our garden, one group will be at Andrew Seed, and then we'll switch. Um, so anyway, there'll be two different options just because we wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to uh, attend if you want to. And the third thing I wanted to mention is that we actually have a, a third. It's a third channel now. So we have our regular Garden Answer page. We have Garden Answer highlights, which are just basically condensed versions of our videos for those of you who want like a quick shot of inspiration instead of a bunch of talking. And then we now have a brand new channel called Garden Answer Espanol. And I know that several of you have already seen it. Um, so it's just an all Spanish speaking channel. It's still me in the videos. We found an amazing voice actor who can translate and she speaks over what I'm, you know, she's relaying the information as I'm talking. It's kind of weird for me to watch, honestly. But I think this is an amazing opportunity for me to learn a little bit more Spanish. I wish that I would have like applied myself a little bit more. We have a lot of Spanish speaking people in our area. So I think it's gonna be really helpful. Um, anyway, we just thought it would be fun to try it out to see if you guys, like if it was helpful to people because we've had just such a huge amount of requests for it throughout the years. Um, so the thing about it is, is that we do need to have like a cumulative amount of hours, view hours and subscribers on YouTube as well as on Facebook. We need a certain amount of likes and watch time. 
in order to start monetizing the videos and put an ad on it. And we're just hoping that we can do that at some point because it is not cheap to have these things, um, to have the videos translated. And we just want to make sure that the Espanol channel can sustain itself. We're not looking to make extra money. We just want to be able to make just enough to get the videos translated. We did have a handful of videos already done um, that we're ready to put up. But anyway, if you guys want to help us out and subscribe to that YouTube channel, like that Facebook page, and then maybe put a video on in the background every once in a while or share it with somebody who might benefit from it, um, that would be amazing. We'll put all the links down below. All right, so that was a lot to talk about before I actually got into the video. So let's just jump right into the first one. So it was a major ornament haul, mail time and tree decorating video. So the uh, groupies Facebook page actually decided to kind of pull together and send us um, garden themed ornaments so that I could decorate a garden themed tree. And so that's what we did in this video. And I opened up so many gifts from you guys. And the first two comments here kind of encapsulate it for me. So Christina said, love this video. How awesome is this? Hope you know how much we all appreciate you and all you do. And YouTube girl 86 said, why does this make me tear up a little bit? Love this so much. And it just was, it's always such a humbling experience to, I don't know, just to see that we actually t touch some lives and maybe inspire you and encourage you to garden more. And that's what, that's why we started it. And that's what keeps us going. So this whole video was just an amazing one for me. Um, so into some of the questions, Carla, and actually this was a super popular question. Carla said, where did you get the tartan lampshade? Love it. I think that was like asked 10 times or something. Uh, in the background when I was decorating the tree, I have this silver Christmas tree lamp with a tartan, red tartan lampshade. I got it at an antique store in Boise. I have absolutely no information on it. I'm so sorry. Um, if I ever find like if I find another one or I find a source for it, I will be sure to let you guys know. Um, I picked it up a couple years ago. It actually stays out all year. I like it that much. Freddie said, Laura, how would you set up a family photo shoot? You have uh, wonderful ideas and designs. I thought that was kind of an in interesting question because I have no idea how I would set up a family photo shoot. <laughs> Honestly, like Aaron and I, we don't, maybe we should Aaron, maybe we should do more like get pictures of us with Benjamin. I am not that kind of person though. I know there's some moms out there who are just amazing at like capturing um, years. My sister-in-law, she is amazing at that. She always has beautiful family pictures and I am like so, I'm so unorganized that I never can get my act together. That was not the question, but that is, that is what I thought about when I read it. Um, Elle said, is there any way you can make an acorn garland for your tree? So I ended up making a walnut and hazelnut, uh, or chestnut, excuse me, garland for the natural tree which is right to my left right here um, and i would probably add acorns just the same way so if you watched our natural tree decorating challenge video you can see how i did that next video was christmas lights tour 2019. i think the most asked question um, was about our electric bill so alex asked how about the electric bill aaron how about the electric bill it's a lot he said it's a lot well, we run them a lot too. Like they're, they're all LED. We don't use any incandescent lights at all. So it could be worse, um, but it is a lot. It is worth it though for us. Like we budget for it. Um, Shelly said, love the purple blue lights on the lavender and the green on your hedges. Did you use blue on the spruces? Yes. I actually took a picture the other night and it's almost a little like trippy for my eyes, but definitely redefining the blue spruce with those blue lights. Do you want to let Russell in? You have to push, pull in. Oh, you pulled the doorknob off the door. <laughs> See, Aaron just pulled the door, whole doorknob off. That's brute strength, Aaron. Jane said, oh my goodness, is that a hay trolley hanging from the barn roof under the hay hood? Is the track still intact inside the barn? Is the barn uh, over a hundred years old too? Um, so I do believe that there was a hay trolley there. I haven't really inspected it. Honestly, I need to go look. I know that there's not a track still intact in the barn. Uh, but I think there might still be some stuff on the outside of it. Uh, and the barn was built before the house, which the house was built in 1919. We thought it was 1909 for a long time, but we just found out. So it's 100 years old this year, but the barn was built prior to that. So I don't know how many years before, maybe a couple years. So anyway, it's a really neat old structure. A uh, dad man dude said, how long does it take to turn all these lights on and how are they all tied into power? Um, so they're all LED, so you can string a lot of them together. And they're mostly all, like some of them stay on all day, um, honestly, and then some are on timers. A lot of them are on timers. So they just pop on at a certain time of day and then turn off. And we um, have electricity, like uh, plugins, stubbed up all over our property. In fact, when we had to, we had some electric buried. And whenever we 
do like a big project, Erin is really good about making sure that we run electric everywhere. Like when we have stuff tore up, you may as well add an extra trench, right? And then you won't have to deal with uh, extension cords everywhere. Jay says, how many outside outlets do you have around your property? Have you ever counted them? So Erin said that there are 10 outlets that are not attached to the house, and then there are a bunch that you can access around the base of our house. Elizabeth says, in the video around 9:10, Erin mentioned that the cypress had turned brown but had greened back up. We're seeing that a lot here in North Carolina. Can you tell us what the treatment was for the tree? So what I did, I inspected the tree first. I looked over it because a lot of times when we see browning like that, especially on something mature, uh, is usually spider mites here in our area. And you can usually tell by looking really close at the foliage, you can see webbing and spider mites are super, super tiny. I can still see them without a magnifying glass, but I know my, my years are probably numbered on that. A lot of times um, you need a magnifying glass to see it, but you can see the webbing and they'll cause browning, but it could be something fungal. Um, in our case, thankfully, it was a water issue. It was water stressed. Um, there was water running by it, so I didn't think about it. Like I saw a drip tube, but it wasn't tied into anything. It was just sitting there. <laughs> I don't know what happened with that. So I tied the line into water um, and added an extra couple emitters and that tree is done so much better. So anyway, if you're not sure what it is, I would double check the water situation first, look it over, see if you see any apparent insects. If you don't, take a piece of it into your local garden center or like a local extension agent. See, cooperative, I don't know what the word is. Anyway, um, they can take a look at it and try to identify what's going on. David asks, how do you keep people from lining up to drive through your property? Um, so it's definitely increased, especially in the last week or so leading up to Christmas. There's a lot of people out Christmas lighting. I mean, Aaron and I love to go do that too. Um, most people stop right in the entryway and they look and they turn around and leave. There is a private property sign out there. Um, some people go ahead and come all the way through and like drive through our actual private property, which before wouldn't have annoyed me, I guess. I guess it's not annoy is not the right word. Um, but like as our channel has grown and things, there have been people that have come and found our home and um, like I don't particularly love that, but we're trying to kind of balance between like keeping private, our private property private, but also like adding to people's holiday enjoyment. Like you put up a gajillion lights, you want people to come and see and like, I don't know, you want to share that. So anyway, we kind of just like, eh, it is what it is this time of year but don't come drive through our private property. <laughs> uh, Linda says, not really the season for this, but thinking about Christmas gift, what Wi-Fi sprinkler timer do you recommend? Uh, we use Ratio. Next video was our winter interest garden tour. It was snowing softly and beautifully the whole entire video. And I just wanted to walk around and show you what we had going for winter interest, like the good and the bad. Uh, Mariana says, you mentioned the ash tree do uh, doesn't grow very well in your area. Does that include mountain ash? Yeah, ash trees in our area are super prone to bores. Um, and so if you don't treat them systemically with an insecticide, they will get borers at some point and they will start losing branches. Like parts of the trees will start to die. Um, I've got two ash trees left on our property. Um, I don't, we've had one removed because it was badly damaged by borers and it was so far gone. Like I, I don't even know how much insecticide I'd have to use on that. And I'm just not willing to do that. There's one in our driveway that's half, like half dead almost. And then we've got this beautiful one that I showed you in the video. That's just like, I don't do much to it. I'm just like, praying that it just stays healthy because it's one of my favorites. They just are prone to bugs. Mel says, I love seeing and learning about the bones of the garden. You didn't mention the calicarpa you planted. Mine don't have any berries on my purple pearls, though it's only its first winter. Are you happy with yours? So mine don't have any purple pearls on them right now either. Um, they did okay this past year in terms of like they're still alive, but they're dealing with a severe iron deficiency issue. I treated them with iron tone late in the season and I'm gonna be treating them again this next year. So I'm hoping to bring them out of that so they can actually start to grow and flourish. Melissa says, your garden is still so pretty even when out of bloom season. Love that you have Baptisia. And the variety I showed was called Pink Lemonade. It's a bicolor yellow and pink, it's gorgeous. Um, we're planting the very same plants in our garden next spring. We thought they grow bigger than what you showed. Are yours still in an immature stage? Yes, they're still immature. Um, since you would not cut them back, do you have care recommendations for them to reap the best performance? So I think consistent water, enough sun, cutting them back in late winter, early spring, or you, Usually I do fall and I just leave the branches just tall enough to where you can still see where the plant is, but they flush back fresh from the ground every single spring. Um, and then fertilizer on an annual basis. I would probably use like plant tone um, or flower tone on those uh, in the early spring. But I think it takes a little, like a few seasons for them to have a big enough root system to create that big, beautiful, dense plant. Gala says, I noticed though that your neighbors appear to have put up a basketball goal right at the edge of your garden. Is that what that is? If so, um, 
seems kind of liable to have balls coming over into your garden. Um, so that was actually there when we moved in. They've had a they have a basketball court slash tennis court right there. I actually kind of like it. I don't mind it being there at all. I've only found like a couple tennis balls in our garden. It's all grass back there, so it doesn't really matter anyway. And I'm just kind of really hopeful that they're going to let Benjamin play on that when he gets bigger, so that we don't have to like figure out a basketball court tennis court sort of situation. So I am not going to complain about that one bit. Vintage Susie says, uh, "What type of boxwood are in the terracotta pots in the vegetable garden?" Um, so those are actually winter gem boxwoods. I tried to get sprinters, which I actually prefer because they don't bronze as much in the winter time. They grow faster, but I couldn't get my hands on any the right size when I needed to plant them. Uh, Camille actually gave kind of a request for spring about doing some more beginner friendly videos, um, like kind of taking it back to basics and we are gonna be doing that. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know, like be ready for it. We're gonna be doing some beginner videos um, that will hopefully help you out with some um, some things in your garden. Uh, Chase says, are you interested in adding a paper bark maple? Yes, I love, love paper bark maples. My parents have a beautiful one in their garden. I had one in our last garden and they're just so gorgeous in the winter time. Uh, Darlene said, have you ever thought about planting witch hazel? Yes, I actually planted an Arnold's Promise witch hazel last year. It's right in back of the chicken run. Like if you're standing in front of the chicken coop and you look through the run, you'll actually be able to see it back there. It's not super big yet, but it blooms yellow in the winter time. The other one I really want is Helena. Um, it's kind of like a yellow, orange, pink. It's so pretty. Mary says, question, I love the gazebo and it's awesome roof, plenty of big trees around it. Why would you take it down to put up a greenhouse? Seems there is more open areas available. I just don't understand. So as we survey our property, like that is just the most ideal spot to put a greenhouse. And I don't know when it's going to happen or if it will ever happen, but the gazebo to me doesn't match the style of our house. Like on its own, I think it's beautiful. It's charming. It's got kind of a rustic vibe to it, but when you pair it up to kind of the style we're going for, it just doesn't quite fit. And we might paint it in the interim just to kind of blend in with our, um, I don't know what we've got going on. And it's been really nice. Like I'm super thankful. It's starting to get really bright in here, but I'm super thankful we have it, but we have such a kind of narrow window in order to use it. Like our winters are usually really long and cold. Our summers are long and hot. So we have like this brief time in spring and fall where we can actually utilize it comfortably. Um, other to, the other times of the year, it just sits there unused, which is kind of sad. Um, so I thought, oh, one day if I could get my dream greenhouse, which is a Hartley Botanic, which is like, it's, like the Rolls Royce of greenhouses. You definitely don't have to have that like caliber of greenhouse to grow things better, but I've always just thought they are so, so absolutely gorgeous. It's just one of those bucket list things for me and I don't know if it'll ever happen, but if it does, oh my goodness, I think that would be the perfect spot because I could see it from all the windows in our house. It wouldn't be very far to walk. Um, and we hope that one day if we ever get to have one that I can have it both heated and uh, air conditioned so we can use it for entertaining and things like that. I wouldn't use it just primarily to grow things. Like I would probably live in that space. Anyway, there are local parks in our area that have very similarly structured things. Like they look very similar to our gazebo. And we thought if the time ever comes, we would donate the gazebo to one of the parks in our city. It would probably be way better used. Leilani says, are you opposed to pompous grass? I love mine in the winter. I love pompous grass too. And I've been meaning to add more grasses into our landscape. So it's probably one we'll tuck in. Um, the, there's a couple different types of pompous. So you've got like the big white and pink plume pompous grass which aren't quite as hardy in our area. So we can't, really, I mean, I could plant them um, and maybe some winters like this one right here, it's pretty mild. They might winter over just fine, but then we might get a true zone five winter and they would be, you know, they would die. Um, so there is a hardy pompous grass. that's hardy to like negative 40. It doesn't have a showy plumes. They're just like, they're big and they're wheat colored. And I think they're beautiful, but that's the type that I'd have to go with. Definitely something that we'll probably add in at some point. Um, Corey says, your garden looks great even in the winter. Thank you. Um, when you plant something new in the fall, do you water them regularly after they go dormant or do you wait until spring? It depends on the year. If it's super dry and windy, I do make sure to toss some water on them just because you don't want those root balls to dry out completely. Um, if you're getting rain and snow and things like that, you probably don't have to worry about it as much. But like I just planted, I had to transplant uh, spirea and a hydrangea over onto the west side in November, like mid-November. And it was super windy that day and it's just like horrible. And we didn't get any moisture for a very long time. So uh, I had it on a schedule to go out once a week and just make sure to give them some water. So it totally depends on the year. The last video was how we winterized our chicken coop. So I basically just gave you kind of an overview tour of the chicken coop, basically to show you how we winterized it because I saw a lot of questions come through. Uh, first question was from Jarek, said, I love your chicken coop. How many chickens did you have left? 
it looks like you have very little compared to how many you started with, which is very true. Um, and I think that's why I put off doing a chicken coop tour for so long. One, because it's not done. I'm still, still trying to figure out some things like roosting um, stuff and you know all that business. But um, when you put videos out like that, especially when it has to do with animals, I think you open yourself up to a little bit more like, what do you think? Like opinions. opinion, judgment. yeah, opinion slash judgment, which usually doesn't bother me at all. And like we get an overwhelmingly positive, gracious response from everybody. And I think anybody who's grown up on a farming sort of situation has a little bit more understanding, I guess, of what this kind of process is like. So I got 10 chickens. One of them right away got caught somehow in a nesting box. I don't know how it happened. Like she got caught behind it. I don't know if uh, anyway, anyway, she died and that was a huge bummer. And then something came through my coop. So the next five chickens caught something. I mean, like one day they were healthy running around and the next day two of them were stricken with something and I couldn't, you know, figure out what was going on. I checked everything. I actually had um, two very experienced chicken keepers come to my house and I had them look like scour everything over. I had them look, they were looking at my birds, like looking at their legs for uh, scaly, like scaly leg mites. They were looking at their eyes, like all over their bodies. They scoured my coop and they were like, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then the other three, it happened to the other three. And so something came through, they were like, it may be coccidiosis, or, but that doesn't even make sense. Like they couldn't even figure out it out, which made me feel a little bit better because I was so sad and so like, discouraged because I thought I had done something wrong. Um, and they were like, nope, you're, I mean, they looked at the feed I was giving them. They're like, you're doing everything right. And it's so clean. It's like, everything's great. So it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, I'm kind of like trying to move past that discouragement. The other four that I have left are amazingly healthy, like chubby hens. I love it. <laughs> they seem very happy with their life. And so whatever like balance we've, you know, landed on. I want to like continue with that. I might get a couple new hens in the spring maybe, um, but I want to keep it like very comfortable and open for them. Anyway, I just wanted to address that. Um, and so that was, yeah, one of the reasons why I kind of put off the coop tour because I was just trying to get over that discouragement and then also didn't really want to like hear a bunch of things that I don't know. You guys know, right? Tiffany said, I love what you've done to convert the shed into a coop. It's my favorite area on your property. You have plenty of room for more chickens. What breeds would you add? So if I do add a couple of hens, I've got a friend who breeds Marins. I don't know if that's how you say it, but they lay chocolate, like chocolate brown colored eggs. And I thought that that would be so fun to add a couple of those. So I think in the spring, I think she's going to raise them until they're like actual laying age. So I don't have to do the teenage phase again. Um, anyway, so I, that might happen in the spring. Roseanne said, this is a non-gardening question. Where do you think you got your energy to work from? Uh, which is actually fairly common. I see that question quite a lot. Did you grow up having to do chores and was it modeled to you by your parents? Are your siblings the same way or is it more of a personal thing? I think it's both. So I think a lot of what we are or what we become as adults is a product of how we were raised and how our parents were for good or for bad. Um, my parents were both extremely hard workers and we had chore lists, like we had chore days. We had daily chores, like all of our animals, of course. And then we had a Tuesday chore list and a Saturday chore list. Our Tuesday chore list was a little bit shorter. Our Saturday tour list was like, nope, we're all pitching in here. You need to go out into the pasture and cut the thistles down or, you know, stuff like that. I mean, we were always working on stuff. We had a lot of fun though, too. And we worked together on it. I think us seeing our parents work just as hard or harder than we were working instilled that in me. But I do think it's kind of personal too. I think some people are just more high energy than others. And I have good days and bad days. Some days where I'm feeling really creative and really energetic. And some days where I just want to sit and watch a movie with Benjamin. So I think there's uh, more and more. So as I get a little bit older. Uh, Rhonda said, usually how many eggs do you get per day from your chickens? So I get three or four every single day. Tina said, I don't know much about having chickens. Do you let them run around outside the coop ever? Is that necessary? I do not think it's necessary if you have a large enough space for them to run around, like their run size is big enough, if they have a proper diet um, and proper amount of shade um, and protection. Um, I do, however, like if you have a tiny little coop, I, they need to be out a little bit. I feel like nothing should be caged like that. That's why I have a hard time with inside cats or inside animals. And I know some animals are raised that way and that's what they know and that's fine. But like for mine, Russell and Cheddar get to go in and out as they please because I would not want to be caged inside a house looking out a window. I just can't, I don't know, that's totally personal. Um, something that I, I don't know. 
that I've just always felt. Um, but my chickens do not get to come out in free range um, because we make a living from our garden and our chickens would decimate it. Um, so that's why we created a nice large run for them. Next question was where do they lay their eggs if they don't use their nesting boxes? They use an alfalfa bag. They get up in it and lay their eggs in it. Um, Elle says, have you ever entertained the idea of putting up a swing for the girls? Some chickens like the swing. I think I'm going to try that. We'll see what they think about that. Um, I did try the cabbage thing where you hang a cabbage from the ceiling and it's just like free hanging and they can peck at it and they're supposed to really like it and my chickens didn't care at all about that. The cabbage eventually went bad and I had to remove it. Um, Allie said, do your chickens have names? Yes. Prudence, Beatrice, Ramona, and Beverly. Michelle says, have you ever considered growing your chickens fodder for a nutritious treat or meal? Um, so my chickens get a ton, like when the garden's in season, they get um, tons of stuff from our vegetable garden. They get lots of kitchen scraps. They get, um, when we weed around, um, they get big bags full of that kind of stuff. So they get a ton of stuff in season. Right now, I usually go through my stuff like every day or every other day, we have a big bunch of stuff to give them. So like last night I went out, I had a bunch of carrot, like carrot tops and stuff. And I had some green beans that were, had kind of like gone a little bad and um, spinach and lettuce. And they got a whole bunch of that stuff. So every other day or so they get a big bunch of new things on top of the food we're already giving them. Uh, Janice says, am I correct that you didn't drill into the plexiglass at all? Just use the screws with the big washers and how thick is the plexiglass? I'm not sure how exactly thick the plexiglass is. It's like that, is that like a quarter of an inch? I don't know if that's a thing. Um, we did not drill into the plexiglass though. It's just the big panels on the back side of the run are held in by those washers. There's three of them on the top and then uh, I think a couple along the top run and the bottom run. And then those front ones were built into window frames um, so that we could remove those and they were a little stronger for wind. Um, Terry says, I've been feeding mealworms to the bluebirds. A small bag is $10. Do you find it expensive to keep the chickens? I know the eggs are probably organic and chickens are cool, but is it worth the money to keep them? I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. So I will not ever add up how much I spend on those chickens because I think it would depress me. Um, I definitely, it's not worth it if you're wanting them for egg production or you're trying to offset costs unless you're doing it differently than I'm doing it. Um, like if you're, you know, they're existing on stuff that you're growing and like there's a kind of a symbiotic relationship between your, your chickens and your garden, I think that that can work. And especially if you've got more chickens and you're able to sell some of your eggs or if you're huge egg eaters um, or if you're raising them as meat birds and we're not doing that. Um, mine are strictly pets and that's the only reason I have them. They are wonderful pets. They're low maintenance. Benjamin loves them and I wanted Benjamin to have the experience of having chickens um, and kind of being raised with them and I just have them for the fun of it. So the cost really isn't as much of a big deal for me. Like eggs are just kind of a fun byproduct. Otherwise they're just pets for us. All right guys, so that's it for this week's videos. Thank you so much for all of the comments and questions. And again, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas. Bye.